Hmm. In this video, I'm going to build a water park on top of water. Bizarre. It's the big pier challenge in Chris Sawyer's Roller Coaster Tycoon. Just when you thought you were dry. Getting off the water slide. Splash! There's a whole body of water beneath you. I like this challenge because you have to build a park without any land beneath you. Just a postage stamp of water to build on. And it's bound to leave you with a dense cluster of coasters in the end. After I did my micro park challenge in my last video, I thought it would be fun to try an equally small strip of land. The scenario Big Pier starts on March 1st, year one. The goal is to get 600 guests and a park rating of 600 by October of year two. That gives us around one and a half years. So the challenge commenced in March of year one. To start off, I had only a little seed capital, $10,000, in the middle of the big sea, but limited to build only on the elevated portion of the dock. So I set the boundaries to the vision for my designs. To begin with, why not embark with the classic attractions of Americana, the Ferris wheel, the merry-go-round, timeless if somewhat cliched. I knew their dense visual clumping would contrast with the lightning-sharp paths of the coasters I sketched out in my mind soaring overhead. All in good time and guests were now swarming in like eager ants at a new hill, making their way toward the next most thrilling ride, scrambled eggs. Then it was on to stalls and rest stations, filling out the empty spaces so that no dot of land went to waste. Every square inch of the park a bright red and white, in bold salute to the briny waves beneath. As I built, I knew it was gonna get harder and harder to see the ground, so I laid the foundation for footpaths below while the year was still young. And by April of year one, I sketched out the blueprints of a sea level footpath leading to the boat hire. I thought this might help raise the park's ratings in time. Now guests had a choice to go it by land or by sea, or even just row freely without boundaries. The park graduated to two levels of excitement and evolved into a new and mystifying optical illusion. Hard to tell there's two levels of entertainment here, right? That's the beauty of 2.5D 1999 isometric graphics. It only got more baffling from here. I built a log flume on top of the water lined with, well, uh, more water. I fine-tuned the approach so that the passenger would splash down at the bottom of the ride, just barely gliding over the ocean itself, lending maybe a sensation that he has crashed and is drowning in the sea. Maybe that sounds ambitious, but all that's to say I thought it was cool we were able to contain water in a ride even above the wild waves crashing below us. All just for one dollar. How could this happen? A water ride on top of water? Bizarre. It goes up, then down, then back up, then slightly less down. Anyway, I continued building the park with a similarly baffling coaster, a rickety old wooden mouse ride. Which, honestly, it would be really ill-advised to build one of these things over seawater. It just eats and degrades wood. It's an accident waiting to happen. But I thought building the wild mouse coaster steered the park in the right direction. Now my rides were weaving in loops and tangling up with one another, adding to the overwhelming complexity and intricate visual beauty of the entire park. Neither ride had crashed, but it, uh, it looked like a nail biter. I'm surprised everyone is still alive. Although I did drown a guy, I mean accidentally <laughs> drown a guy, when I opened the attraction. Naturally, you'd probably think that would hurt the park's ratings. Actually, it didn't at all. In fact, our ratings just kept rising as if there hadn't been any death, and there weren't dead people beneath the pier. That is to say, nothing could slow us down toward our objectives at ratings and attendance. I thought I'd raise the elevation, so I constructed a ramp that doubled back on itself to reach new heights in the park. Now I can see the land as a snow globe to be peered into, filling up with exciting attractions and rides. I built the steel roller coaster, the shuttle loop, a death-defying wager against its passenger's mortality, who braved 40 miles per hour launch speeds. 60 miles per hour launch speed. Uh, maybe not that one. One lawsuit later and we're back in business, repainting the shuttle loop in ominous white and black to warn patrons of their impending doom on the ride. That waived any expectations of survival and it made room to begin working on a dinkier steel roller coaster beside the death machine. It helixed, looped, and went up, then down, then up, then back down again, and parked safely back at the station, swerving past the death coaster in worthy salute to its confident passengers. Meanwhile, traffic was brewing at the boat hire, so I hemmed in the path, forcing riders to relinquish their free will to enjoy a now-planned road through the imposing metal barriers. Things were humming along though, and I used the spare cash to fill out the lower level footpaths. Trash cans, benches, 
maintenance people, and janitors. A slide for little tykes. And then it was on to my favorite attraction, the water slide. A red tube of speed and danger, which, believe it or not, actually contained no water at all. It was a challenge, but I managed to thread this thing back into the station platform, where the tubes rested and wait for new passengers, eager to vie for their own chance to uh, drown in the ocean because of a baffling violation of the laws of physics. I swear, the tubes just, they started passing straight through the slide. They're not solid. So I built the solidest tubes money could buy and charged the big bucks. One dollar to board the ride. It wasn't long before pigeons were harmoniously swooping along through the curves and drops of the long, smooth tube. Finished. This one was really difficult to test because the tubes that get stuck, well, they, they just disappear into a void of oblivion never to be seen again. And if you obscure the view, uh, there's no way of even knowing what's going on. It was okay. I had reached a point where I honestly couldn't even see half the park trying to peer through many colorful coaster tracks and multiple layers of flooring. But I'd finally begun to create something that was overwhelmingly beautiful to gaze upon. An explosion of color, excitement, movement, and gay activity there on the water. A convoluted, chaotic, and beautiful tangle of a park floating on a postage stamp. Next, I constructed the Observation Tower. A tall, foreboding presence I donned, the Tower of Baradur an homage to J.R.R. Tolkien's The Lord of the Rings. It's a large, all-seeing tower capped by an orange eye that honestly put the height of the rest of the park into perspective. We still had room to grow in scale and overall altitude, but I had laid a wide and exciting foundation. Next, after more research, it was onto the bumper cars. When you first build the bumper cars, chances are you build them close to your merry-go-round. This means you're going to be hearing the cacophonous competing of two musics that are totally at odds. The corny, brass, sentimental classics of the merry-go-round, old people music, and the EDM bangers blasted by the bumper car speakers. Still so much park left to fill out, though. What was next? I decided it was time to allow freedom of choice back into our park. I constructed Boat Hire Number 2 where patrons took the liberty of deciding for themselves, once again, who to be and where to row, unrestricted by the comfortable but controlling boundaries like in Boat Hire 1. And so I repainted them. After all, each ride was just a metaphor, right? In the words of Morpheus, the red pill or the blue pill? After all, what's a day at the amusement park without a search for capital T truth? The park was nearly complete, a tangled mess of colorful architecture and a feast for the eyes worth savoring from every angle. Guests lost themselves in a labyrinth of pleasure. A maze of novel, exciting sights and sounds. A sublime sensory overflow poured and shaped in metal, wood, and concrete. Next, it was time to fill in the last gaps. A Viking ship, honestly, uh, wherever I could fit it. And a suspended roller coaster. This thing was crazy. Probably uh, what ended up being the most ambitious ride in the park since its support heights could reach just so high up there. This thing was like Medusa's hair, tangled, twisted, and above all else, dangerous. The nausea and intensity ratings were off the charts, so high it just took many attempts to lower the vertical and lateral G's so they didn't look like this. I gave it a sharp white paint job, and then I rested. After nearly a year and a half, the park I had labored at so long was nearly complete. A spaghetti bowl of fun, a chicken noodle soup of kinetic energy and friction. It was worth appreciating at lower and higher altitudes, at which different features appeared more prominent. The guests, the spires, the architecture, it all begged a painstaking visual study of the new emergent properties at each level. With my goal in sight, it appeared as if I had accomplished even more than the scenario objectives. A park rating well above 600, and more guests than I'd ever need. At last, I tied it all up with an observation ride so that the guests, too, could feast their eyes on this visual aneurysm, this celebration of what computers are capable of. And to me, that's what it's all about in the end. The love of creating, the act of getting caught up in the architecture, forgetting who you are, and then snapping back to awareness to gaze upon and behold what majesty the planning brain can set down in pixel-perfect vision. A picture worth a thousand, no, a million words. It's always fun to revisit Roller Coaster Tycoon, but it taps into a deeper love I have of planning, logistics, existentialism, and computer games. I hope you enjoyed, because my patrons are currently 
drowning because they picked boat hire too and now I have to go catch them. I'm Ambiguous Amphibian. Until next time, my friends.